During the 1990s, the combination of Jimmy Johnson's coaching and Jerry Jones's ownership resuscitated and redefined the biggest brand in football. Under the leadership of the Jays, the Dallas Cowboys became more than champions. They were America's team, a brand so popular it became even bigger than Texas. So in 1994, when veteran coach Barry Switzer found himself interviewing for a suddenly vacant Cowboys head coaching job smack in the middle of what could have been a dynasty run for Johnson & Jones, Switzer, who coached both men as players at the University of Arkansas, found himself asking the question on everyone's mind. I want to figure out how you guys both fucked this up. Decades before they reinvented football's most famous star, Jones and Johnson met as linemen for the Razorbacks in the 1960s. Jones, a middle-class kid from Little Rock, played offensive line, and Johnson, who grew up poor in the Texas Gulf, was opposite him on defense. After their college playing days netted them a national title, Johnson immediately made the jump to coaching. In 1984, Johnson succeeded the legendary Howard Schnellenberger at the University of Miami, eventually winning a national championship during a dominant run with the Canes. Meanwhile, Jones floundered in restaurants and real estate until he made his first million in the world of 1970s oil wildcatters. Over time, Jones became an energy and real estate mogul, with a fortune big enough to purchase a languishing Cowboys franchise in 1989 from H.R. Bum Bright. His first order of business was to fire the legendary two-time Super Bowl winning head coach Tom Landry. Then Jones booted GM Tex Schramm and put himself in the role. Jones and Johnson were never close friends, but had stayed in touch over the years. Jones even helped put in a good word to get Johnson his first head coaching job at Oklahoma State. But just as Jones bought a Dallas franchise bleeding money off the field and losing on it, Johnson was red hot, riding a 52-9 run with the Hurricanes. Johnson loved Miami, but the allure of the NFL and rebuilding the legendary Cowboys brand was too much. To get Johnson to leave one dynasty in hopes of building another, Jones convinced his old teammate with one simple agreement. Johnson would have complete control over the football and Jones all the business. This seemingly simple arrangement would be the root cause of all the strife to come. To this day, Johnson says he was the sole decision maker in free agency, trades, and drafts, while Jones, the self-appointed general manager, claims he helped architect the roster of what would become America's team. The city of Dallas's reputation in the 1980s was as a glitzy boomtown, a culture constructed to coddle the kind of millionaires who couldn't truly feel rich unless they were showing it. Jones and Johnson were both overqualified to fix the Cowboys, and success seemed inevitable, but as archetypes of both their respective industries and the era, they were doomed. Johnson, and or Jones, stripped the Cowboys down and rebuilt through a painful 1-15 season in 1989. After finishing 7-9 in 1990, proof of concept was evident, as was Jones's growing awareness that Johnson's football success, although minor to that point, drew way more attention than any of the sweeping moves Jones had made to turn the franchise profitable again. I can make $5 million and no one gives a shit. I want to have some of that fun. Both parties claimed a happy, symbiotic relationship during the two-year rebuilding phase, but then Jones started holding his own weekly press conferences during the season and even served steak to reporters just to boost attendance. As for Johnson, already a proven winner and on the cusp of breaking through as a pro coach, he wasn't interested in sharing credit for his good work with an increasingly public-facing owner. I had a big ego as well. Why shouldn't the story be told as it actually happened? In Johnson and Jones's third season together, the Cowboys broke through, finishing 11-5. Johnson claims in his autobiography that after the Cowboys started winning, Jones offered to rework his head coaching contract three different times if Jones could take some form of roster control back in writing. I refused each time. That wasn't negotiable. In 2014, Johnson told ESPN that Jones was against the famous 1989 Herschel Walker trade that kickstarted the Cowboys' eventual resurgence when Minnesota sent Dallas four players and eight draft picks for the running back. Jones had literal ownership, but was starved for credit. For the 1992 draft, Jones allowed television cameras to broadcast the Cowboys' war room live, but without audio, a move Johnson begrudgingly agreed to before realizing Jones was creating his own personal reality show. Johnson was now working out a draft day trade with the Cleveland Browns on live TV, so according to a Sports Illustrated story, Jones allegedly told his coach, whenever you're about to make a pick, you look at me like we're talking about it. In the 1992 and 93 seasons, the Cowboys would win back-to-back -back Super Bowls over the Buffalo Bills, ensconcing both men as NFL legends and cementing the Cowboys as both a nationally popular brand and a burgeoning dynasty. 
But behind the scenes, Johnson and Jones were barely speaking, often battling over petty grievances and a long-term war over who was most responsible for the wild success at hand. In his book, Johnson claims that winning on the field only made his life inside the franchise worse. My deteriorating relationship with Jerry was compounded by the draining role I played in driving the team to a second Super Bowl title. In December of 93, during the run to another championship, a frustrated Johnson told reporters that the idea of coaching the brand new Jacksonville Jaguars franchise was intriguing, a comment years later he admitted was just public posturing to irk Jones. It worked, and behind the scenes, his owner was enraged at the idea of Johnson leaving to coach an expansion team. To this point, the pair's battle for credit was at best a media sideshow, eclipsed by the on-field success of two titles and a core of pro bowlers intact. All that changed in March of 1994. According to multiple reports, and Johnson himself, the undoing began at the league meetings in Orlando. An allegedly inebriated Jones wandered over to a table where Johnson and various former Cowboys assistant coaches and their wives were eating dinner and proposed a toast to Dallas's championships. When Johnson's table, some of whom had been fired by Jones, returned the proposal with blank faces and dirty looks, Jones stormed off swearing. Later that night, Jones would tell two Dallas Morning News reporters, quote, there are 500 coaches who could have won the Super Bowl with our team. That comment, along with what Johnson believed was consistent leaks from Jones to the Fort Worth Star-Telegram to smear Johnson's commitment to the franchise, was a bridge too far. In March of 1994, Johnson and Jones publicly announced Johnson's departure from the franchise, including a $2 million contract buyout. Johnson was leaving a dynasty at its peak in the football world in shock. Predictably, neither party retreated from the spotlight. After the breakup, Jones became the most visible owner in the NFL and maybe all of professional sports. The Cowboys hired Switzer, another Razorback buddy who Johnson felt embodied Jones's 500 comment. The former national title winner at Oklahoma had been retired for five years, but Jimmy and Jerry's mutual friends still managed to pilot their roster to another Super Bowl win in 1995. As of 2023, Jones is still the Cowboys owner and general manager. After a mediocre stint with the Miami Dolphins, Johnson retired and became a weekly television fixture with Fox. Just as the America's Team run of the 90s faded into history, the pair began a fresh war of words. Stories about how and why those Cowboys of old became both popular and apocryphal, and the two could debate authorship all over again. In 2014, ESPN published a huge profile on Jones, who finally summed up his disdain for Johnson as an issue of loyalty. Disloyalty. I had paid so many times a higher price to get to be there than he had paid. It was unbelievable. When reached for comment in return, Johnson said that Jones came off, quote, like a rich asshole in the story. But if time heals all wounds, in Dallas, Texas, a good marketing campaign is a faster salve. In 2017, the long estranged Jones and Johnson were physically reunited at a United Way event to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Cowboys 1992 championship. That night, Jones seemed to amend his famous 500 quote with a mea culpa about his former head coach. There's no question the contribution that he made to the success Johnson was worth five number one picks to be the Cowboys coach. Weirdly, at the same event, Cowboys legend Emmett Smith blamed the media for overplaying their beef. Jimmy's been supportive of Jerry, just like Jerry's been supportive of Jimmy. Ironically, the pair made it a point to compliment each other to the local media, the exact arena where they'd sparred decades back. Jerry was especially honest. Jimmy and I really understand the circumstances. I've always had to overlook his foils, but he's had to overlook mine too. Decades after that meeting with Switzer in 94, Jones told the story to the media, and when asked if he could answer Switzer's question today, he admitted he couldn't. I've never been able to know why I fucked it up. By January of 2020, this beef seemed all but cooked. Johnson was inducted into the Hall of Fame, celebrated by Jones with a big congratulatory media statement. The exact kind of display the owner used to infuriate his coach with was now a gesture of honest appreciation. The following summer, Jones had even teared up while admitting he meddled too much with his 1-500 Super Bowl winner. Jimmy's a great coach. It was my job to keep it together. Should have had deference to something that was working good. But egos like these keep growing right alongside with their age. In 2021, Jones announced that Johnson would be inducted into the Cowboys Ring of Honor, joining his former players Smith, Troy Aikman, and Michael Irvin. At the time of the announcement, Johnson picked at his sensitive old boss, asking if he'd be inducted, quote, while I'm alive? With Jones seemingly at his most humble state in decades, at least publicly, Johnson piled on, telling the media, Jerry doesn't ever want to admit he's wrong. Over a year after the announcement of Johnson's induction to the Ring of Honor, no date had been set. When pressed by local media about the event in 2022, Jones reverted back to his confrontational state. 
I get to make that decision. It isn't, at the end of the day, all tailored around whether Jimmy is sniveling or not. Johnson, of course, used that comment to make a fresh round through the media, saying he, quote, never sniveled in his life. For years, both men refused to publicly acknowledge each other's role in a success that's become legend. A success that looks big enough to share, at least from outside of Dallas, Texas. And then, after eventually relenting and doing just that, for no good reason, Johnson and Jones just couldn't let it be. In the Jerry and Me chapter of his 2022 autobiography, Johnson claimed that no one understands his relationship with Jones because, quote, I don't even understand my relationship with Jerry. He also retold his version of the Hall of Fame induction in 21, inadvertently capturing both the emotional depth of their respect for one another, but also their fragility of ego. I know how much you contributed to my success, Jerry told me. I love you. I love you too, I said. But at times I hate you. At times, I hate you too. All right, guys, thanks for watching this Texas sized beef. Please like and subscribe to Secret Base. And for more NFL videos, click here. <laughs>